the application of robotics in the manufacturing sector and in other sectors of the economy. And to do that, we have a very distinguished panel. We have Professor Bram van der Borgt from VUB in Brussels. We have um, Mr. Christoph Winterhalter. He's the chair of the executive board of DIN. We have um, Sigrid Brel Chokchan, uh, director of individualized production at RWTH Aachen University and president of the Association for Robots in Architecture. We have Professor Mina Lanz. Uh, she's a professor in mechanical engineering, production systems and technologies at Tempere University in Finland. And we have Pietro Tavis. He's chief operating officer, robotics and automation, automation products at Comau, which is a well-known uh, Italian maker of uh, robots. So um, to, to kickstart uh, this session, uh, we will have um, a presentation by Professor Van der Bort about a study he's doing on uh, the results uh, that are coming from the, 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 um, the projects that are running in the framework program on robotics and some of the conclusions you can draw from uh, those studies. I just would like to remind you two, two things. The first one is that at the end, the objective of this session is very much about understanding what we should be addressing in the work program on robotics in the future. And this is about technologies, but this is probably also about aspects, maybe of analysis of things like uh, impact of robots in the factory in terms of uh, impact on the jobs, or maybe also in terms of ethics um, uh, for, for what concerns the, the introduction of, of robots on the factory floor and in interaction with our, other human beings. And the second thing I wanted to remind you is that we have a Slido. So that means that uh, I invite you already now, as you listen to the different uh, presentations and ideas, to introduce questions that we can use for Slido that we will be addressed by the speakers in the second part uh, of uh, this conversation. So the Slido um, is probably, uh, you can probably reach it from the app of the conference, but also on the website of, of Slido. And the code of the event is, of this event is R900, okay. So I'll give the floor to Professor Van der Bort and to the findings of his study. Yeah, thank you for your kind invitation. I'm Bram van der Borg, Professor of Robotics at the University of Brussels. And I work in human-robot interaction for health and manufacturing. And I'm also core lab manager in Flanders Make in Flexible Assembly. And together with the European Commission, I'm writing an independent report on industrial collaborative uh, robots. So why we need collaborative robots? A uh, long time ago, all the work was done for the elite uh, and completely manual. And then we entered into the mass production area where we introduced the robots for the dull, dangerous and uh, dirty uh, tasks that human workers used to do and that could boost the productivity of the companies. And today we move toward the mass customization area. Uh, and in this we want to take the best of the craft area to do customization uh, with the best of the affordability of the mass production area. And sometimes it's called uh, Industry 5.0 as a successor for Industry 4.0 in which we now try to achieve. And traditional robots are not very uh, useful to this. They're very fast and precise and useful for many applications, but very dangerous and have to be kept in cages. While I think we need to take the best of the machines and humans, and humans are very handy, dexterous, flexible, creative, while machines can endure endurance, uh, they have also strong and so on, and can handle a huge amount of data and also constant uh, quality. So why not combine the best of the two? And that's also a very important economic reason for collaborative, robot, uh, for collaborative uh, robotics. And moreover, they're also very suitable for SMEs because they don't require so much floor space. The idea is that uh, everyone can teach new behaviors to the robots and that they can also be much more flexible. And then, of course, there is also the human point of view for collaborative robots because humans are the most important asset often still in a factory. But we still see that they have to work in non-ergonomic conditions like working above the head or in unworking, unhealthy environments. 
Moreover, uh, productivity becomes more and more complex. So we need technology to physically and cognitively support the human. And in this, uh, to make this happen, a, an evolution in technology has to be performed. It had to go from the purely con uh, position-controlled robots to robots that could interact in a safe way with a dynamic changing environment, which also includes humans. So new activators had to be developed, new sensors, new control principles, new AI, eh, to make this possible. And one of the extremes of this is, of course, wearable robotics, or the so-called uh, exoskeletons. And I think it's safe to say that Europe is really leading this, and this is also largely due to the massive amount of funding that uh, was put in collaborative robots. And now with days we see that the strong European uh, robotics industry, they almost all have cobots in their product portfolio. But moreover, we see that also a lot of new companies are founded had to offer this uh, technology and services. So Europe st starts from a very strong position in robotics. And also according to a collaborative uh, market study, Europe has also the biggest market in it, but it has the threat to be uh, overtaken by the Pacific Asian region in 2025. Moreover, we must admit, I think, that also the amount of collaborative uh, robots in the factories is still very limited, especially where there is really a physical collaboration between the two. So we see now that there is a big wave of projects focusing on applications of those cobots. So I think the first uh, question is, which further research uh, should collaborative robots uh, focus on? And although SMEs are, play a really an important role in the projects and also have a lot to gain from this technology, not all the SMEs, of course, there is only a minority that have the capability and also the ambition to work in those highly prestigious European grants. But how can we make that all the companies in all countries uh, can benefit of those research results? And I think an important tool to achieve this is the Digital Innovation Hub, which we can further discuss in this panel. And the idea of collaborative robots is not only useful in manufacturing industry, but also in healthcare, agriculture, uh, food industry, uh, service robots, household robots, and also construction. And especially in the last one, the use of cobots is, is, I think, very rare, and we can further discuss this, but it's also because the payload is limited, the range is limited, and the ability to handle very irregular uh, and unstructured terrains. And an important issue in collaborative robots is liability. Yeah, computers, they are also multifunctional, and running third-party apps but they have a limited liability. But robots can do physical harm. Um, moreover, they are very complex, they need to learn, they work kind of autonomous, they can do several tasks, so uh, liability is an issue. And for example, I was working in a project at Audi Brussels, not so far from here, where we introduced a cobot on the actual manufacturing line. It was human-centered, it could understand uh, gestures and express emotions. Uh, but we designed the system as such that we avoided as much as possible collaborative work due to uh, liability uh, issues. Moreover, we want interoperability, we want open source projects, uh, programs. Uh, so I think we should also discuss the role of standard certification, benchmarking tests, and so on. And moreover, what is the role of Europe in it? Hey, we want a digital, single digital market so that all the rules are everywhere and that we have one uh, market. And I think part of this discussion is this, is do we need experimental zones, or in the Japan they call it toku zones that we need to develop? Because the technology has to de be developed, but also the regulation and standards, and maybe we need places, for example, in factories, where researchers can, in a safe way, uh, do experiments and mitigate risk. And then we need to come to a joint agreement between regulators, the company, insurance companies, uh, etc. Finally, we also need to be aware of the fear among the general public towards robots taking over jobs. Many studies say there will be less jobs, some studies say that there will be even more jobs. I think we can all agree that the jobs will change. And I think we need to teach our children to excel in those things in which robots are very bad. Moreover, I think STEM, science, technology and engineering and math, 
leads to more important focus in our compulsory education. But education should not stop uh, when the children leave the schools or the university, but we need the government to support lifelong learning in the uh, workplace. Moreover, there are certainly ethical aspects when using uh, robots, for example, safety, privacy, responsibility. And technology is often neutral, and subconsciousness or consciousness, norms and values sneak in the design. And we should not see ethics as a showstopper. I think Europe needs to embrace those values and act it as a differentiator compared to the United States and Japan and build sustainable approach uh, to technologies. So to conclude, digitalization, robotics and AI is often see seen as a threat. But in fact, I think with proper management and including uh, ethics in it, it can be a huge opportunity for both the society as the economy. And as such, it also needs to be embraced as a top economic priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bram. That was a very nice summary of uh, all the important issues that relate to robotics. And uh, it's also important to remind, as he highlighted, that Europe is uh, strong in robotics. When we present uh, the European position in different digital technologies, robotics is one of those areas where we can claim that Europe has a strong position compared to other parts of the world. But uh, the uptake, however, of robotics in the sector is a little bit lower. And, and then I would like to ask to uh, Mina Lanz, uh, you're a professor, and can you make me understand if in the area of robotics we are, because we are advanced, we should just rest on our laurel and, and just focus, so maybe on stimulating uptake, or there is a need of more research in robotics, in particular for manufacturing, what would be the technologies that are really important for the future. All right, that's, that's a, that will be a long answer, but I'll try to keep it short. Uh, at the moment, we have good uh, technologies available, single technologies. But when we start combining the technologies, the combination of technologies is quite low still in the TRL level. So the technology, what the industry needs, the SMEs needs, uh, it has to be more mature so that they can take uh, advantage of the new technologies. So I, I come from the Finland. It's a traditional country with the low volumes, uh, high value products, highly skilled workers. But still the ad adoption of robotics is not very high. And there is a partial reason is that um, the combination technology is not industrial quality yet. Uh, for example, in the human-robot collaboration, we are in the level where we can uh, make the systems feasible. It's a proof of concept. We can make <coughs> it. Uh, the second level would be that we can make it safe. That we can do. But if we look for the productivity point of view, we are not there yet. And then the fourth would be the, is it comfort, is it the ergonomic for the human-robot collaboration? So the tech Single technologies are existing, but the combination is still what where we need to put some effort. Of course, that relates to the standardization very heavily. That would be the partial answer. Thank you very much. So we get the other part of the answer in terms of, sub of uh, standardization. Uh, you are an expert, and maybe you can tell us a bit more what is the state of play now, and what is the future of standardization in robotics, because it was highlighted by Bram the importance of the digital single market and the possibility for companies to be having access to, to one market and not several of them. And standardization is crucial from this point of view. Thanks for the hint about the importance <laughs> of standardization. I think let me give you an answer in two different categories. One category is where standards are needed. And I agree with you. We, have, we want to make robots work, but we want to make them work not in the lab. We want to make them work on the shop floor. And that requires some kind of integration into an existing environment. Safe integration is one thing. And of course, agree on what are the interfaces to all the equipment that already sits on the shop floor, where we have a more intelligent robot, and that's one of the other buzzwords. These robots have to be a little bit more intelligent, because we want them to move around, we want them to be more flexible, because there is no fence, so they have to interact with the environment. 
So there needs to be some kind of vision integration. There needs to be a certain level of intelligence. And if, if things become intelligent, we need to have rules to define what are these robots allowed to do. What are they allowed to do with the data that they are collecting? How do they process the data? And that brings me to the rules that we need to define for artificial intelligence. You mentioned the topic of ethics. I mean, what do we want to do with autonomous systems? And I think we need to make up our mind and we need to describe that in technical standards. So one of the big challenges in standardization is to define roadmaps. What are the rules? How do we regulate an artificial intelligence and how to deploy it into certain applications? And one application area that is obvious is robotics. So that's one thing. The other thing is, of course, I mean, how to ensure safety of these more autonomous robots, how to do a risk assessment, how to make an automatic risk assessment with the support of simulation and all the data that we have collected about the, the objects that we are trying to put together. So that is the challenges in what needs to be standardized, where everybody needs kind of to involve himself into standardization activities as early as possible. The second thing is, if we have more intelligent robots, we don't want to process the result of the standardization in a manual way. We want to have the standards in a machine-readable form. And I'm not talking about PDF files. I'm talking about a structured XML file that actually can be understood by an artificial intelligence so that we have robots understanding standards, giving them some kind of limitations for the reasoning, which is more like a long-term project, but it's kind of reaching at the a vision level of conformity by design, because we have all the rules available in machine-readable format. So there's a lot of interesting activities going on in standardization to make it kind of, to make the necessary standards for the new technology and to make the standards machine readable that they can process in a more automated way. But just following up on this, can you see a time frame for this? Because a lot of people would say standardization really important, but in Europe in particular, it just takes too long. I mean, standardization is not like only the typical development of a classical standard that becomes an ISO or IEC globally accepted standard, which might take two or three years. There is other ways of standardization where you can create documents in two, three months that are a certain hint in a certain direction that have to be updated much faster as technology evolves. But at any point in time, you have like a consistent set of rules that are defined in the standardization committee that actually can be used by SMEs sharing technology, sharing the knowledge how to apply technology, and kind of describing how that has been achieved in a standard way. Very good. Thanks a lot. Sigrid, we talk about um, robots on the factory floor. Normally, we know that the, man of the automotive sector, for example, is the most advanced sector for having robots in the factories. But what about other sectors of the economy? You are from the construction sector. How is that application going in Europe? Well, thank you for this question. I think I also want to continue on the standardization because I want to see standardization as an enabling technology or an enabler to actually bring robots into construction. I actually came back from China yesterday and I was astonished to see construction companies just putting construction robotics directly on their own construction sites. So it is for us important how to transfer robotics direct, directly into the field without prohibiting the use of robotics. So we, have, we must not be fearful in Europe because it's important that we will be able to build uh, affordable houses in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, we will be able to, to have enough workers to assist robots to do quality in construction. So this is more important to understand how we can lift this technology into new domains and also what does robotic mean? Does it, that, does it mean that we have construction machinery with more intelligence so that we can actually pro process the data directly to the construction site? Or does it mean that we need to develop new robotics, new robotic system that can work together in a more collaborative way with uh, the human? Thank you. Then I would like to ask uh, Pietro from Comau. Comau is a large company. You produce robots for the automotive sector, but you also produce robots for other sectors. So are there differences, and how do you explain this difference in the take-up of uh, 
of uh, robots in the different sectors. Yeah, sure. Now, in fact, we start from an automotive background. Uh, come out since 40 years, we build uh, robots and production systems for uh, spot welding and all the body um, shops of uh, car makers. We're also part of the Fiat Chrysler group, as you probably know. But since few years, we're also going into new application. That's what we call the general industry. That's all kind of application in electronics, food and beverage, even construction, all the way to medical and logistics. And what is needed is exactly, referring back to Bram, uh, this, the, this, this importance of uh, collaboration between human and machine. That's something that we call U-manufacturing, this new concept that we created at Comau. It's collaboration between human and machine, between machine and machines. And in terms of application that we see, especially for the small, medium enterprises, we see all variety of applications. Think about food, robot in, uh, uh, for packaging of food that needs to stay cold. So, you know, you easily need to have a robot going down to mi minus 20 degrees, which is not an ideal situation for people. Going away into electronics. Electronics require object detection and uh, computer graphics, so a lot of uh, no, knowledge is needed in the software and computer graphics for recognizing object. Construction, I mean, more and more we look into uh, solar panel assembly, for example. That's another era where robots can improve quality, can relieve uh, the fatigue from people, and can, can really integrate uh, what uh, the people can do. And thinking about collaborative application, the people can really focus on the key part of the job, which is keeping quality, keeping a high level of pro quality and productivity, while the robot does the heavy lifting. And then all the way to logistics. It's not just warehouse logistics, but it's also airport logistics, for example. I mean, think about baggages. I mean, uh, how many of you lost baggages, okay? So when you are able to put together a good automation system for that, I mean, it's really key. So there's a variety of opportunities and where obviously we need to really create a lot of collaboration with the uh, certification standard and the university. We have at Comau a lot of collaboration with Italian university, German universities and so on. And we can really identify a lot of opportunities exactly to increase the penetration of robots also in those industries. Thank you. So if it is uh, currently a bit difficult to bring robots into other sectors of the economy, what are the solutions that we can find to facilitate this uptake. Uh, Mina, you are also a leader or you work in a digital innovation hub. I'm not sure the, con the concept of digital innovation hub is necessarily known by our audience, but maybe you can explain what you do and what a digital innovation hub is and what you think that could be ways to help bring in robotics to all the sectors of the economy. All right, so I'm the coordinator on the Trinity uh, project, which is uh, developing the robotics innovation hub uh, on the agile production. Uh, we are building different networks in order to facilitate the technology transfer so that we could bring the expertise to the companies and companies would have uh, easier access to the different laboratories, different technologies, different expertise. Uh, in Finland there is the 93% SMEs and they are focusing on their work and they don't have time to come to the Europe, visit on the uh, uh, nice laboratories and look, uh, read about the projects. They need more filtered information and more precise information in order to understand the technologies and take, take those into account. So that's one role of the uh, Digital Innovation Hub. The second role is, or the main task I would say that is the uh, the skills development. So we have to support the continuous lifelong learning uh, education, which is not only the formal education, but non-formal education as well. Uh, for example, it's not a very concrete problem yet, but in 2030, 2040, we will have a serious lack of engineers. Uh, if I concretize it, in Finland, uh, today we had 40 8,000 open study positions into the higher education institutes for bachelor and master level. Uh, this year, birth, the children born this year will be 46,000. So in 2040, when we have the next growth season, we simply don't have engineers. So the digital innovation hubs are aiming to create ecosystems where we can uh, share the skills, share the knowledge workers. And then the third, maybe the most uh, short term, is that uh, we want to support the experiments 
demonstrations, proof of concepts for the companies, so that they could do uh, Horizon 1 uh, projects, meaning that they are the low-hanging fruits, uh, testing different technologies, looking that maybe they, these technologies could be mature enough to be in their factory floor, or combining different technologies and test and try them. That would be the short summary of the Digital Innovation Hub ideas. Thank you very much. In fact, the European Commission is funding a number of digital innovation hubs in the area of manufacturing and, that of, and also uh, networks of digital innovation hubs for robotics. So that's very important to keep in mind that that's a very important uh, instrument to bring uh, robotics to small and medium enterprises. So Sigrid, do you have other ideas, alternatives from the construction sector that could help uptake in there? Yep. Um, in Aachen, for instance, what we do is we build up a construction reference site. So this is a mediator in between the research lab and uh, the actual construction because what we have to take into account is that we, we need to train robotics together with, um, with the human worker to understand if they accept uh, also from the ethics uh, uh, robotic systems. So we want to have a really user perspective uh, in, in the robotic field. Um, and uh, this is one of, uh, an, uh, one of an, an enabling technology that could help. And I would like to see more of such reference construction sites within uh, the European uh, uh, countries because it is important to really let people work together with robotic in an, in an environment that is uh, safe uh, and, and to learn from these training situations and to learn from the normal workers and not from the experts who are already uh, programmers because we also have to transfer this skill set from our digital youth to the actual domain and we have to guide this skill set so that it is best used and also that robots can be best used. Thanks. Christoph, you already said that standardization is an enabler for bringing mm. robots to different sectors, but do standards need to differ across sectors? And do standards need to be European or global? In most cases, standards need to be global. But I think we have a big role to play in Europe to heavily influence international standardization by showing the world how it works in a safe and inclusive way from the first day on. And I think I have to add on what we are doing quite well is getting things tested in the labs, opening up the labs to kind of make it possible for SMEs to use the lab facilities and actually participate on these kind of pilots. But bringing still these pilots into practical use on the factory floor is thus another story. So I think it's very important that we are not wait until we have the maturity of the technology and then we start standardizing, describing how a mature technology works. That has been the focus the last hundred years. But moving forward, we need to think about standardization and the rules that we need how to safely deploy your new technology from the very beginning. So it is very essential that when building a pilot, that with setting up the pilot and learning how a technology can be used, that we describe it. And we describe it in the form of standards, that it can be shared, that it can be complementary to the existing set of technical rules that we are managing in the standardization bodies. So I think the mindset in the standardization area changes a lot from very rigid standards that needs to stay there for, let's say, at least five years before they are re-evaluated. No, we have to have more agile standards, but they have to be described like standards that can be kind of read and understood and used by everyone along the development of a new technology. Okay. And uh, uh, Pietro, as uh, a, co a large company like Comau, what can they do to help in the ecosystem uh, smaller enterprises to introduce robotics in their business models? Yeah, several things. So first of all, we also have some digital manufacturing hubs and we participate on most of the digital uh, manufacturing, some of them that you also mentioned. What we did is that we created a sincere, uh, what we call a Comau Academy. So we also, on top of the collaboration with universities and, uh, and digital hub, we have also our own school, where what we do is that we train students to program robots. 
So far, we train up to 3,500 students over the past few years where they have a real certification to be able to program robots. So we try to really create these capabilities so, so that they can be deployed into other industry or into our own company. Uh, we also uh, train people to the new technologies in terms of software development, whether it's data scientists, data analytics, AI and machine learning specialists, that's what we do. So we try to really take it from the school back to your point of the 40,000 plus missing uh, uh, engineers and bringing up to this, uh, to this uh, level of capabilities. So that's what we really do. It works very well. Most of the people we train then get hired later on by ourselves or by other company and create this, uh, this uh, cycle in the, in, the, in the factory floors. And sometimes we have even people, I mean, their, their parents work in the shop floor the, the, the kids, they work in software programming in our company. So, but this requires a lot of investment also in terms of creating the proper educational capabilities. In fact, we also created an educational robot that we use to provide this training and it works very, very well. Even with, uh, with uh, first uh, graders and basically uh, basic school, we have them installed in various places of the world. Okay, very good. So, um, obviously, as a learner, one would want to find a, a robot teacher. Otherwise, what's sure. the point? Uh, but going back to Bram now, you heard uh, the interventions of uh, the other speakers. They told about uh, future technologies, difficulties in the uptake of, uh, um, of, um, of robotics, uh, despite the fact that we are world leaders in the development of robotics ways of uh, facilitating this uptake. Uh, what do you make of all this? How would you, uh, given the knowledge you have about our projects and about the topic in general, how would you advise us, um, or how would you advise a policymaker like me to uh, design a policy that really manages to make sure that robots are used in all the factory floors, in all the sectors of the economy? Yeah, I think um, one important aspect is it's so different angles, we need so diff many expertises that we really need collaborative work in order to make it happen. Eh? Ethics, social, human, uh, technologies, materials, I mean so many disciplines and big companies have already challenged to do that, but what about a small company? So that's why I think it's very important to have uh, the collaborative framework of, of Europe. Moreover, often uh, new companies, they focus a lot on their product, but how to manufacture that? Hey, that's left alone and then they need to assemble it, maybe they send it to China, but you need research not only the product, but also on the manufacturing process in order to realize that, I hope in Europe, and not all send that manufacturing uh, to China. But I mm. think we need to have the funnel, eh? we need still core technology developed, eh? because we want to assist the human, but the human machine, ourselves, our bodies, enormously complex, huge capabilities that are far reached by, by robots. <coughs> and so we need still fundamental work on new materials, new actuators, new sensors, and of course artificial intelligence, but also there the work is not yet done. Artificial intelligence is now a black box. Eh? We don't know why it took a certain decision. It cannot explain us. So also there we need. And then we need the pipeline towards applications. And then I think collaboration with you, uh, industry is very important, but also how to foster entrepreneurship. Eh? Because that, like you said, that ideas don't get stuck in labs, yeah. but are taken out of the labs. And also there, it's a huge effort to do that because also such a company needs a lot of expertise from different disciplines and also there we need uh, support. So I think the future is uh, bright, there's a lot of challenges and I think the future is in our own hands and we need this good governance to make the best out of it. Okay, very good. Now I'm told that there are some questions on Slido. I'm afraid you have to turn around or there is a television down there. Um, so how to integrate, please uh, send in your questions, eh? and uh, also, yeah, you can send in your questions. How to integrate workers' experience and positions in the process of working with collaborative robots? Yeah, I think it's very important. Eh? For example, in the Audi case, uh, and also in other European projects, when we enter a factory, yeah, workers are afraid of, of us because they think well, we come there to replace their work. So there, for example, the role of uh, sociologists, for example, is very important 
to in a co-design process designed together with the worker how the technology should look like. And not at the end, here's a solution and you have to work with it. And, and that's it, they have a lot of experience, they have a lot of needs, and we need to go in interaction with them to solve it. And that will increase a lot the acceptance of those robots. So for example, the cobot at Audi is the only one in there hundreds of those robots with a nickname, for example. And so the robots, the workers really adopted these robots. So again, the need for multidisciplinary aspect, not only the technical side, but also the social, the human and the medical side is extremely important. Okay, Sigrid, you wanted to add? Yes, I wanted to add that, especially for instance, on, on construction side, it has to do with adaptiveness in robotics, because you have to adapt not only to the human, but also to the environment. So here we have some good experience in more flexible, easy to uh, easy use robotic in haptic programming and so on. So I do think that how to transfer data f uh, to robotics will change massively in the way how we train robots and how we program robots in the near future. Okay, um, I think Christoph. There are at least two questions for you. <laughs> yeah, it looks like. Uh, so I don't know, Important pick issue. one uh, and tell us which one do you pick first. I, 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 I mean, I, I answer all of them, but uh, just pick one now. I, I can start with the one on top. I mean, when it's okay. about interoperability, <laughs> it's about we need to define interoperability of data, that is standards in ontologies, in data structures, how to store data, how to explain if you store data somewhere, what it is. So that means we need to agree on some kind of structure. And then, of course, open source can be one way of defining the data structure in a very interactive way involving a lot of people. But in the end of the day, we will end up a standard. How to store data, that they are interoperable and can be used for any kind of application. Anybody wants to add anything on this I one? think it's very important. Uh, typical uh, robotic companies have their own programming standards, but now we see more and more the use of those open source. Yes. And I think it's important because you want to have the robot arm from one manufacturer with the hand of another one, with the vision system of the other one, and how you can, in a standard way, connect them and certify them and use them on the real application floor. And that's yeah, an important issue, and it allows the market development. This was also the answer to the question. It's yes. you. Okay. It's not standardization bodies that develop exactly. the standards. It's the researchers, it's the general public, it's industry representatives, it's kind of system users that actually use the final application. I mean, they all have to come together. And then we have to agree on. And that, I think, is an important role from, for example, the funding agency to request, especially in the application research, not the fundamental research, to include standardization in the project. Because it's very important, in Europe you have a lot of small and medium-sized companies, how do they all have the time to, to work on standardization because it's a long-term process, but it's extremely important that they're not overtaken by American big companies that dictate us over the standards. So that's why Europe can play a facilitating role that is important to focus, to yeah. be part of that. Sigrid? Yes, I would, I would also actually add some problem that I see with European projects, is that you create a, a huge network during a project, but what is happening after the project? You know, very often it's not so easy to really nail down um, and a development to bring it into standardization or into the market just when the project ends. So I, we th I think we have to think about what comes after the project and that's, that would be something that I would bring back to you, Thanks. to the policy makers, <laughs> mm. how, how we can enable the fur yeah. further development because I've seen so many pr real great projects mm. die after they finish the project. Mina. Yeah, I actually had a comment on that. Uh, on the on the Trinity project, uh, we aim to develop 150 different technologies, technical modules that could be combined into the different user cases. Now, what happens to these 150 technical solutions after the uh, Trinity ends? And that's actually something what we have to develop in the future digital innovation hub projects that all of these examples what we generate inside the consortium or with the external companies, they should 
contribute to the standardization. That should be the material what we use in order to push the standards forward. But I think it's very important that during an R&D project, I mean, you develop a new technology, then you have a pilot, and then you go to the next project. While in standardization, you have to maintain exactly. the result of, let's say, describing the rules under which the technology can be deployed. So it must be taken over by a committee consisting of researchers, industry, consumers, whatever, that takes care that this standard is kind of evolving. No, and, fact, and in order to do yeah. that, it's very important that in conjunction with, this, with the R&D project, that we develop initial content that can be taken over by a permanent standardization committee. Mm -hmm. And that kind of transfer, that throwing over, that fact, is not I, structured. I want you know. to give a real example. I mean, with the first uh, truly collaborative application that we developed, we developed together with uh, customer, but also through the standardization, we work with several standardization bodies that help bring in the product out of the laboratory yep. into the factory floor. And then the same people that I got working on the project are traveling here and there, Brussels and other people, to really make sure that the, the procedure is done. The only point that I would suggest is speed. We got to go much, much quicker. <laughs> Otherwise, if it take two years to translate a real application into a piece of paper, you know, competition is already gone. I'll give the floor to Laurent Zibel now. So, uh, my name is Laurent Zibel from uh, Industry All European Trade Union, so the European Federation of Trade Unions in Manufacturing. Um, I was, this question is essentially for Mr. Winterhalter. You mentioned uh, the fact that uh, the rules uh, regarding the behavior of robots, uh, specifically regarding safety and interaction with workers, uh, should be defined by standards. Mm -hmm. um, well, my question is um, the standard making bodies are pretty unbalanced. Uh, I mean, the, the committees are uh, unbalanced. Uh, the representation of, well, trade unions, NGOs, etc., is much, much smaller than that of industry. And um, in that sense, um, is um, a process whereby essential requirements would be defined by regulation. Correct. Uh, demo democratically, with a much broader representation of society, would probably make greater sense to give the, say, the the big picture of uh, of the requirements, whereas of course the details then go into uh, into standardization along the um, now classical model of um, the so-called new approach, uh, mm -hmm. yep. uh, even if it dates back to 1988. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another question down there. But I mean, it, it's absolutely right. I mean, the essential requirements should should come from the regulator, but then it's of course the standardization body that needs to be. At equally balanced, represented by not only industry, but also by consumers, which is the case in most standardization committees, at least the ones that I'm responsible for. And of course, it's also up to the regulator to make sure that we have the right environment to motivate people representing societal interests into the standardization bodies. Because all the committees are open, and I've had talk about now about uh, artificial intelligence. There is a lot of representation from societal stakeholders to make sure that the technology that is finally deployed is accepted by the users. There is a question. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, my question was, uh, robots have been introduced in the auto sector. What lessons can we learn from them in the relationship uh, between the robots and the workers and in the working environment? Who would like to I can, I can take it. Uh, yeah. So. What we, what we really learn from the automotive application is really, and back to the point of uh, developing product in collaboration with people and employees, what we did in several applications in automotive is that we actually involved the unions. Guys, we involve union, we involve uh, ergonomic experts, especially when we talk about exoskeleton and wearable devices. That's a really good approach, and, and it comes from the automotive that is very structured, really cares about cycle time reduction, quality improvement. But there's, there's a false legend that we cannot use the same approach also with SME. We can do it obviously on a, a smaller scale, but, uh, but we can also take care of this. And what uh, really I would advocate and learn, transport from the automotive experience, is really the collaboration with the workers. When we develop several products, we actually ask the workers to participate in the development, in the trial of proof of concept and stuff like that. So this interaction, <laughs> continuous interaction, so eliminated the barrier between us developing robots or wearable devices and the workers can be easily applied also outside of automotive. Yes, and there is a related question for Mina in the Slido, how to integrate the 
user perspective and the worker skill set into the into the design. So, yeah, actually, I will combine a couple questions. So that question what was directed to me, and then the how to make robotics technology affordable for small companies and. The technology itself is not expensive. Uh, the, taking the technology into use is expensive. Training the workers, uh, doing the reconfiguration of the machinery, of the safety systems, uh, whenever the production is changing, that is expensive. So in order to reduce the cost of robotics, we have to make the systems more reconfigurable, we have to have the safety system reconfigurable, we have to use the artificial intelligence automation on design uh, the system, that it is actually reconfigurable fast. That comes to the, also to the users, that uh, we have to train them and increase the education, and learning to learn is difficult, nobody wants to do that. So there is a hesitancy among the SMEs that they don't really want to work. Uh, on learning new things, not necessarily in the factory floor. It's a bit different on the car factories and high technology environments, but if you have the small company which has done the 20 years same thing and the need to learn new things is not yet there, but they would still need to take it into account, there is a lot of hesitancy. But uh, then we come to this uh, co-creative, collaborative uh, design of workspace. So we have to involve the users, the robotics users, we have to transform their knowledge to be suitable to work with the robotics. And there's absolutely no, no other way, because we can't, can't just take the knowledge and stuff it in somebody's head. They have to learn it, see it, and be familiar with it. So the technology acceptance has to come from their own experiments. Yes, I would like to continue here to also give an, a good example how the Association for Robots and Architecture actually solved this problem. Uh, we actually designed uh, um, a software out of our computer-aided design software. So this is also related to the question in construction, typically drawings are of not production quality. So actually we took the use and the control of robots into the environment of the user, which means uh, architects and construction companies, they work in computer-aided design software or in building information modeling, and we managed actually that uh, the users directly out of their own surrounding and environment, a digital environment, could use robotics. And we've, we see now in the last 10 years more than 100 universities actually have industry, industrial robots in, in their education and about 20 to 30,000 architecture students actually graduate with robotic knowledge. And for me it's so important that also construction industry takes this knowledge from our uh, master students into, directly into the companies because that's, that's what we as universities can do is we can educate engineers with the new know-how and we can also educate users how to easy access robotics out of their own known environments and I think this is a gap that we also coming or like I am an architect so I'm not coming from robotics but it's important that mechanical engineers, roboticists and also that the domain and process owners sit together and develop um, a, a good environment for users to actually access robotics in a very easy way. I think it's indeed also an important lesson which you can take from automotive sector. The car is designed to drive, but also to design how to be produced by robots, especially the body of the car. And that I think is needed in other sectors, not first design the product and then think how we need to assemble it with a robots, but during the design of the product that already the limitations, but also the opportunities of robots are in included in the design of the process and like for example you say uh, educating architects how robots can be used in that process very good there is a question from the gentleman down there can you the, please but send the microphone is, is here the but the microphone is here yeah, so he's been asking for a long time so uh, sorry yes <laughs> we'll take the two questions and then uh, i'll ask an answer yeah 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, citizens. My name is Angelos Karlaftis, EPAFOS Advisors. We represent here the Urania and Helio Space and Defense Group. And uh, there are three questions, actually. Uh, uh, please ask are... one, the most important <laughs> one. We, are running out ones, of time. Uh, we want to, to change the culture, because the culture we are following in robotics and artificial intelligence is American or is Far East. It's not European. So we believe that uh, what you call standards uh, they are, can be described very simply by the laws of Asimov, a European who uh, wrote them three, uh, 40, 50 years ago. Instead, we are uh, going to regulate again what the Americans are here with the cleaning the houses with small robots, which they are interacting already. They are, you can pay 300 euros and you can get them. And we don't have a product, a European product. So uh, it's very dangerous to humanize the robots. It's very dangerous, this. We speak for ethics. Ethics is for humans. It's not for, for the machines. So uh, the, the cyber security is very important. Because when you speak for global things, what kind of global things? We are Europeans here. Global things means that, that they are going to control our robots from somewhere else. So the cyber security must be discussed first for the benefit of the citizen. And uh, uh, we have to be more flexible and understand the market. We don't understand the market. The market is here, it's working, but not by European hands. And if we want more engineers, the Finlands, they can make the, uh, the process to come back the people which are left for Europe. Thank you very much. Yeah, let's collect also this question. In the meanwhile, just to tell you that from cybersecurity, we have the Cybersecurity Act, which has been proposed by the European Commission and will start entering in force, I hope not in too very long time, whereby certification for cybersecurity uh, will be uh, mandated to ENISA. Please. So for the introduction of the robots in manufacturing, probably the first priority should be to replace those kind of works which are high, with high incidence of professional diseases. So are you aware of some studies that have been done mm -hmm. indicating what kind of specific type of works have to be the priority in the development of the robots? So to all these questions. Well, I mean, I can, I can just answer the question for the construction sector. So the construction sector is one of the sectors with the highest <coughs> accident rate. Yeah? So about uh, 15 to 20 percent of <coughs> overall accidents happen in construction. And it's also known for the heavy duty work that uh, um, the workers are doing, that most of the times after 50 years, they have to retire. They can't stay in their own work. So this is something where I definitely see that with the help of intelligent machinery and also with the help of robotics, that, is, that it will save also our social, uh, social um, system from, from having to deal with diseases out of this, just the work surrounding. And the experience we also had with workers is that, that they're, they're really happy if they have uh, some some machinery that assists, you know? So, so the, the fear that they take away jobs is something that we definitely don't see in the construction environment. Because it, it saves lives, it saves health, and it, you know, it prohibits from getting dusty, dusty lungs and, and so on. So a lot of, also in demolition, or if you think in uh, like the nuclear environment, I mean, there are so many fields that actually, it's better that machines enter these fields and not the human. But Can I one think of you please uh, answer the question on are we dominated by uh, an Asian or an American culture when it comes to robots? Ah, it's uh, the pop culture or the entertainment <laughs> that makes indeed a lot of fear and I think it's a huge opportunity of researchers and companies to do dissemination to tackle that uh, fear and not show there is no problem, there is only a robot utopia over there, uh, but that there is a, a balanced way and Robotics and artificial intelligence is not a hurricane that overcomes us. No, we have the future in our own hands and we need to build on that. And that's why we have those sessions. We have uh, dissemination to young children, to the general public. And we need to keep on saying this, the, the story that we want to work on those robots that help people. And that's, for example, on the ergonomics, extremely important. I think you asked also we should avoid robots look like humans. I completely agree with that. If, for example, Google Duplex, you call that system, that AI, and you cannot even make the distinction anymore between a human. I think it's not ethical and wrong. On the other hand, I think we need to make those robots human-centered. And how we collaborate, 
Then communication is important in how I talk, but I also do gestures and emotions, and robots need to understand that and communicate that. So not looking like humans, but having similar capabilities, I think, is important. Okay, now we only have uh, five minutes uh, before closing, and so I would like you to think of that question you have there on top, how do you see robotics in 10 years from now? Because on the basis of that, that question, I would like to receive from you an idea of what you would like actually to see in the work program on robotics, because that is going to be what will then materialize probably in 10 years from now. So uh, who would like to start? Uh, yeah, I think we often overestimate the short future and we underestimate the long future. I think we need to agree that research is riskful and that we are allowed to fail uh, and that we need to think big but also realistic. And that means that we need to include also how we can include failures and also openly communicate about that. And because now we see a lot of very cool videos, and maybe you saw the last video of Boston Dynamics, which under which environments is this made and how repetitive is this and so on, are, what are the benchmarking tests and so on. So we need to make a correct view on what is possible in the near future and that is an increasing insight in it. Yep. Okay. okay. I mean, uh, I had already a vision for standards that are machine readable so that robots can actually understand and process the rules that we have defined for them. That doesn't need to be traditional standards. It can actually be how we want robots to behave in a European way, in the European environment. And I think it's up to the standardization bodies, together with all the stakeholders that are involved, to define how that is going to work in the future. I mean, from a process point of view. Well, I also think that what you are going to do in the next days is to draw and to, to motivate a lot of uh, European associations to work together. So there is also a strategic innovation roadmap between EU robotics and big data uh, association. So I think this is important to understand how data is also going to work together with robotics and vice versa because data is not jumping on its own to some domain, but it has to be mediated by machines and intelligent machinery on, and robotics. So I would really also like to see these uh, strategics to, to be bound together that we can focus and streamline our common interest in bringing Europe uh, in front and forward. All right, from, from my side, uh, when I mentioned that there is a skill gap in Finland, Finland is doing rather well. The bigger problem is Germany, uh, Spain, France, where you actually your demographic profile looks like a diamond. So in 2030, I would like to see robots uh, filling out the positions left by the retiring people. That would be my, my mm -hmm. dream. It's usually the nightmare for the general public an engineering dream of the having the automated factory, but since we don't have en enough engineers, that's something where I would like to go. The second thing is, of course, that I would like to see the uh, human-robot collaboration to go into the level of productiveness. So now it's slow and it's expensive, but I have high hopes that uh, in future it's, it will be productive. For that, we need, for sure, using the ontologies, the semantic information for describing the content and the mm -hmm. context and actually the situation and then applying the artificial intelligence. No, I think uh, robotics will follow uh, the evolution that consumer electronics had. So in 10 years from now, we're going to see robots much simpler to use. Simplification will be a big issue. Software driven, um, connected, uh, mobile, wearable. That's, that's the evolution, so no fear, don't be afraid of robot. I mean, the robot will continue being a tool. Remember, robot is a tool. Human being use tools since decades, yeah. hundreds, thousands of years. So a robot is just a tool. It has to be much simpler to use, easy to drive, easy to read, like we do with every tool that we have right now, with a smartphone or even autonomous vehicle. That's how we see robots, so no fear. Thank you very much. So I'm very glad to hear that uh, the vision of the future of our expert is about a future of no fear. We on the side of the European Commission, we will be funding research, obviously, in that sense. And we will also be putting in place policies, in particular in, in the area of artificial intelligence, to increase trust 
and that will be obviously very relevant for the robotics community and the area of robotics. So thank you very much for your participation. It was great. You had great questions. And join me to applaud our excellent speakers who have very interesting insights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to see you again. <laughs>